I hope everyone is awake. <laughs> if not, I will make you. <laughs> uh, first of all, maybe I have to excuse myself a little bit. I didn't prepare a fancy presentation because for many reasons, but honestly, we have a lot, a lot of work these days at Muse, really a lot, because we have a file to make at the end of this month. It's the global file that we have to enter at the Ministry of Culture to hope that we get <laughs> for the next five years uh, good subventions. So that was uh, the big, big priority for the last two months. And then beside that, of course, we have a lot of projects running all over Belgium. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a, <laughs> a d disappointing start, but I prefer to say it in advance and to tell you also that we at least we want to share some thoughts that we have on the Educarte project. Uh, we are still very much in the preparation phase of this uh, project, so we didn't start yet. Uh, there was no single atelier until now. We just made the first uh, uh, contacts with the artists and with the schools. So everything is still very, let's call it embryonal, you know, embry in the beginning. So, but it could be interesting also to share this with you and to have some feedback of you, what you think about this. It's always nice to know how people receive this. Um, where shall I start? Maybe a little bit about Muse Belgium before I go into the Educarte project. Maybe it could be nice. Uh, I don't know if you know the situation in Belgium. It's quite specific. Uh, we have uh, two, let's call them communities in Belgium. Uh, it's very strongly linked to the language that we speak. In the north, they speak Dutch. It's called Flanders. And we call them the Flamand in French, the uh, uh, Flemish people. <laughs> and in the south, there is uh, Wallonia. We call it Wallonia. They, they speak French. Um, and then you have in the middle, more or less, the capital of Belgium, which is Brussels, which is a very interesting city, not only because I live there, mm -hmm. but because it's a sort of laboratorium, uh, I think, for the future in the sense, or maybe already for today, because uh, I forgot the exact number, but it's more than 150 nationalities living together in Brussels, more than 150. It's, uh, I think, after New York or Singapore, the, uh, the city in the world where the most diverse population is living together. It's really uh, very strong, very strong. There are so many different kinds of people, also because of European community, of course. We bring a lot of expats in, but uh, other people coming from all over the world. So this is a very interesting city where we work a lot with Musa. Uh, I'm not responsible for Brussels. It's also good to, to know that you have a little idea of the structure. I work only for Flanders. Uh, that's also why we do this project with Ghent. And Ghent, it's, uh, it's not Brussels. It's also a, a very interesting city with a very rich culture and rich history. And also, of course, a diversity, like all the cities, I think, nowadays in Europe. You have Ghent, Antwerp, Brussels. These are the three big cities in, in Flanders. And then you have Namur, Liège, uh, Arlon in the south. Um, so that's, that's the way we are structured. We have coordinators for the three different parts. So I also have, which is very interesting for us, French-speaking colleagues. And I say it's interesting because we talk a lot about making connections and uh, trying to dialogue and intercultural exchange. Actually, we experience this every day, in a sense, because we speak another language and we have to try to understand each other, uh, although I speak very good French in the meantime. But, I mean, it's still sometimes a, a challenge to, to get to know what we are doing and how we can do it together and how, how can we make each other stronger. It's a very interesting situation uh, because also there, there are, of course, like everywhere, some differences in the approaches. So it's very nice to, to, to get to know that, uh, this way of working. Um, globally, we work, I don't know how it is in your countries, but uh, because I was wondering when I was looking at your beautiful work and your wonderful clips, how long the projects take. We work most of the time for two, three months. 
so like, let's say for nine, ten uh, ateliers that we go, ateliers, you know, atelier, like workshop, workshop. Do I speak too fast or no. is it okay with the mask and so on? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I would prefer like this, but it's not allowed. <laughs> um, so two months, more or less, yes. Uh, nine, ten times uh, the, the artists go to the schools. Um, that gives you a, an idea of the frame. Uh, it can take longer, but not so often. Because honestly, I have to say, for X reasons, but one of the reasons is that the schools think it's already quite a big uh, Let's call it engagement, uh, in commitment, commitment to to give to give this kind of time, especially in the secondary schools. In the primary schools, it's much easier, but in the secondary schools, the teachers are, I have to say, the last years more and more we want to finish the curriculum, so we don't have time for this. You know, uh, maybe you recognize this this problem. <laughs> Uh, another very important thing is, uh, I guess it's the same with you, that we give uh, carte blanche, we give, we give the artists uh, the opportunity to start from scratch. So we actually we hardly ever give a sort of team uh, 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 an idea that they have to start from. We, we, we engage them because we think they are strong personalities, that they are very interesting artists, that they have a a living practice as an artist uh, and of course very very important that they can make a participatory uh, dynamics with the group it's not easy not every artist is uh, willing or able to do that you have to go into a dialogue with a group of kids or, or youngsters it's a special kind of work uh, i've been a teacher before <laughs> and i know what it takes it's a challenge it's a big ch it's a beautiful work but you have to be very open in your curiosity and your mind to make this. Uh, we call it actually we call it intercreation. You know, they of course they bring in a lot of their expertise, their experience, their research that they did on materials or techniques or ideas, all this kind of stuff. It's a lot of uh, luggage they have, but you have to be able to forget all that and to see what's coming from the kids and from the youngsters and to pick, pick it up to, to be able to work with the inspiration that they give you. Again, again, of course, there is a very conscious choice to, to put in the artist because we really believe that a good artist has this capacity to, to be open-minded and at the same time to bring it maybe to another level because they have sort of skills on the level of the form, the way they deal with the uh, texture or with materials, with colors, you know, they can bring in something special that the kids maybe don't know by themselves or don't learn in the regular uh, cur curriculum, let's say. So it's really, a, how shall I say it? It's a laboratorium. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's always a sort of experiment, honestly. And we also try to, I'm a coordinator, so I'm not an artist. What I do, for example, one of the many things <laughs> I do is to have a very good, strong communication in, in the beginning with the teachers, with the artists, like, please, we don't know where we are going. You have to try to accept this, that it's really like an adventure. We cannot go from A to B to C to D, we go, like this through association and improvisation. <coughs> and this will create some chaos and some insecurity, but we also believe it creates a lot of uh, well-being and freedom of expression. So I, I felt in the, in the few years that I do this work, I, I started in 2018, when I didn't have this uh, open talk with the teachers, sometimes it creates problems because they expect something you know, clear they don't want to have a lesson, but they, they want to see a result or, you know, I think you know what I mean. Like, where is this going? Why are we doing this? In the beginning, there's a lot of brainstorming work, you know, trying to build up, create the ideas and the fantasies of the kids. So it takes time. It takes time before it becomes quite concrete. I would like to show you just a little clip. It's only six minutes. 
Um, it's in French. Yes? Okay. It's in French with subtitles in Dutch. Even better. <laughs> better, huh? The, the subtitles... I just... <laughs> I just want to show it. Um, I think I think a lot of things you, you will recognize. I hope, uh, but it's quite interesting because this uh, clip has been made. No, no, not a clip. The survey. It was a sort of research from the university in Brussels. Was made by a sociologue uh, who wanted to investigate what creative artistic ateliers could bring. Uh, as extra to the education of the of the children, and so you will see, you will feel more or less the evolution that he made, being a scientist from the soci sociological point of view, how his thoughts and vision on this kind of work was uh, evolving. Uh, I think it's very beautiful, but <laughs> of course I'm not objective. Uh, if you don't understand, just tell me, and then I translate some of the parts in French. Uh, into English. Quand j'ai fermé mes yeux, c'était tout noir et un bien. Et alors, j'arrête pas de penser à des trucs. That I think is very beautiful what she said. When she closed her eyes, before everything was dark, and now she cannot stop to see a lot of things, which is very strong. Par la SBD News et financé par la Fondation BNP Paribas Fortis. Ce programme organise des séances artistiques hebdomadaires à l'école et l'idée de la Fondation. C'était d'essayer d'évaluer l'impact du programme sur la prévention du décrochage scolaire. Vous comprenez Au départ, j'étais un peu surpris. Organiser des séances artistiques à l'école, c'est très intéressant, mais je ne voyais pas en quoi cela pouvait constituer une priorité. Pourtant, beaucoup de chercheurs ont déjà traité du rapport entre l'art et l'école. Le rapport le plus direct étant le transfert de compétences. Si je résume grossièrement, ces recherches postulent qu'en faisant de l'art, les élèves entraînent des compétences qui peuvent aussi leur servir à l'école. Par exemple, faire de la peinture, travailler la motricité fine et la maîtrise de formes géométriques dans l'espace. Tout ça, ce sont des compétences qui peuvent être utiles dans une carrière scolaire. Et effectivement, nous avons pu constater que leurs compétences artistiques s'amélioraient. Mais ce que j'ai trouvé passionnant, c'est que d'un point de vue sociologique, le potentiel du programme dépasse largement le transfert de compétences. Tout ce potentiel est lié au choix de Muse de faire appel à des artistes professionnels. C'est Patrice. You know Patrice. C'est la formation et l'expérience des artistes qui permettent de créer des dynamiques dont ils n'ont pas forcément conscience, mais qui peuvent être extrêmement positives pour les élèves. création d'un espace rassurant. Les artistes savent que s'exprimer artistiquement n'est pas facile, qu'il faut du courage et de la confiance surtout quand on débute. Ils sont donc particulièrement attentifs à créer et conserver un climat de bienveillance et d'encouragement. Grâce à cela, chaque élève peut se sentir libre d'oser et de dépasser la peur du regard des autres. La deuxième dynamique est liée à cet espace positif, parce qu'il se trouve que la pratique artistique est très forte pour remettre en question les normes que les enfants intègrent sans s'en rendre compte. Les élèves apprennent qu'on peut être un garçon et danser avec un autre garçon sans faire semblant de se bagarrer. On peut être une fille et aimer les activités technologiques 
comme la prise de son ou le stop motion. On peut tout simplement être un enfant et envisager une carrière dans l'artistique sans que ce soit forcément un rêve inaccessible. C'est une dynamique intéressante parce qu'elle permet aux élèves de repenser des choses qu'ils croyaient normales ou évidentes. Une autre dynamique est le maintien de l'intérêt des élèves. Si les élèves veulent autant participer, c'est parce que les artistes ont à cœur de proposer des séances innovantes. Ces séances sont pleines d'expériences uniques qui surprennent tout le monde. Les enfants, les professeurs et même les sociologues comme moi. Plusieurs des professeurs n'ont d'ailleurs pas résisté au plaisir de participer avec leurs élèves. J'ai pu voir certaines séances qui ont réussi à mélanger chasse au trésor, apprentissage du tissu social et création artistique en un seul mouvement. Toutes ces dynamiques, le programme arrive à les créer au sein de l'école et en collaboration avec celle-ci. Ce qui est une bonne manière d'essayer de compenser les expériences négatives que les élèves pourraient vivre à l'école et qui pourraient mener plus tard à un décrochage. Au final, Carte Blanche propose des expériences artistiques utiles et uniques que les écoles auraient du mal à reproduire par elles-mêmes. Il constitue également un excellent outil d'éducation sociale dont le potentiel ne pourrait que profiter d'une plus grande collaboration avec le milieu scolaire. These are the artists that you've been, that you saw working. <laughs> so um, it was a, a very interesting experience also for us to have this connection with the university because to have this external eye uh, coming into the ateliers because maybe for a lot of us it's quite obvious, let's say, what we do or uh, let's, let's say that um, uh, what we gain in citizenship and in the commitment and in imagination i think for all of us it's clear <laughs> but it's not the case for for everyone uh, like you know very well society is still not really based on the artistic it's based on the rational and the intellectual uh, the profit uh, which all of those things might be important but not only that and we try to stress on other things which are uh, not uh, valid enough and even the sociologue who was very open-minded was really surprised by the power and the, all the extra side effects let's call it uh, that you, that you gain with this work what I like a lot especially me because I was not a, I was a, like a boy that liked to dance you can see that the boys uh, are free to dance in a in a free way and not trying to prove themselves by trying starting to fight immediately or the other way around that the girls can also play with computers and be very technical if they want to I mean it opens up a lot of possibilities for different kind of kids and I think that's a very beautiful part of, of the work that I do and the work that music and all of you do of course um, and like you saw I think the uh, the key word is experience it has to go through the experience uh, not definitely not only through the mental uh, perception but the body the senses the heart <laughs> all these kind of layers in a person we try to um, connect with to reach the whole person to make a holistic uh, approach of the work 
all this to say what we are doing more or less. Maybe I can say a little, a little bit about this booklet that we made last year. It's called More Than a Thousand Stories. It was a, a project actually on, um, it sounds very intellectual, the word visual literacy, you know, like uh, being able to look closer, more aware, with more awareness, um, and more critical also in the end. Uh, at least to raise the awareness when you are confronted with uh, images by creating a lot of images themselves. Actually, we, sh we chose the way of, of drawing, uh, of making a sort of illustrations in a, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, yeah, maybe in an innovative way, in a, in a different kind of way that they were used to. A lot of the kids, they wanted to, they, they asked the, the, the artist, tell me how I have to draw, how can I make a technical good drawing, but that was not the, that was not the objective of, of the project. The objective was to enlarge their uh, fantasy and to give them a sort of skills to, to show up this fantasy. So, for example, what did she do? It's one of the examples that I give you. She created uh, different islands with different kind of techniques like collage, like charcoal, like uh, just a pencil, only pencil, like chalk, you know, different, uh, very different kind of techniques. And she asked them to, to create their main character with the different techniques. So they had to pass from one aisle to the other. And um, it was a very beautiful uh, experiment because they, they discovered a lot of uh, ways to, to give more expression actually to their, to their character that they chose. Uh, we, this is, I, like, I like this drawing also because it has a sort of simplicity and a poetic touch, which is, I think, thanks to the collage and maybe also the speed that they did it. They didn't have to think too, too long, so they created immediately the main boat of one of the stories that the boy chose. Uh, this project is called More Than a Thousand Stories because the starting point was, of course, you all know the stories of 1001 Nights, I guess. Mm -hmm. The beautiful Arabic stories. And we chose that for two reasons, because there was an exposition on this storytelling uh, in a museum, but especially through the illustrations of the stories, not, not uh, uh, let's say that the entrance was not a language. It was the image which was the main entrance. The second reason was is because there are a lot of uh, Arabic kids in the school also, and they were most of them were very much surprised that these were stories, fairy tales, written in their uh, language. Uh, so that's also why, for example, just a little detail, we put uh, the title also in Arabic in the booklet mm -hmm. to, yeah, to make a connection with another kind of uh, culture. This is a booklet that we made after the project, of course, not in, in the beginning, just to give a sort of um, uh, inspiration inspiration booklet for teachers and other artists if they want. Definitely not to copy what we did, certainly not, but to give you some fuel, oxygen, to, to go your own way and to work with storytelling and storytelling by uh, images, by the visuals. So, are there any questions <laughs> in the meantime? <laughs> mm. Then maybe uh, just one last, do I still have five minutes? A last thing about uh, Educarte, of course. We are still in the, in the process, in the research. But uh, for the moment, we are, we are uh, thinking about taking this man, taking this man as a sort of a main source of inspiration for Educarte, Erasmus who was a very modern man, actually, who lived in the 15th century, but in his thoughts, in his ideas, he was amazingly modern. I'm trying to read this book. I say I'm trying. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's really very fascinating because he was, a, the more I read about him, I'm not an Erasmus specialist. Please don't, don't make me an historian. I'm not, I'm not. But the more I read about him, he was a, the, the, the title is Dwarsdenker in Dutch. It's like, um, um, someone who's thinking not in the mainstream way, you know, like someone who's thinking like on the crossroads, you know. Uh, what was very difficult for him in his life, he had a lot of problems, 
he was not a big fan of the Pope, but he was not a big fan of Luther, neither. Luther, who, you know, made a, a counter-revolution against the Catholicism, but he didn't like Luther, neither. Actually, he didn't like dogmas. He was afraid of dogmas, and what he wanted to represent was autonomous thinking, critical thinking, trying to think for your own, to find your own way. That's why we think he's still very important today uh, as a figure also to represent, in my opinion, maybe the European values that we try to defend nowadays. Freedom of speech, intellectual freedom, open debate, uh, all this kind of stuff. If there's one thing I would like to be associated to of Europe, it's that, honestly. <laughs> uh, maybe there are other things. Um, another big important thing for him was books, books, literature, stories because he lived in the time that uh, printing was invented, press printing, Gutenberg, which was a huge change, of course, for society, enormous. And I think it's also very interesting to, to, to communicate this with, with the kids, because like you all know, we're all the time on the phone, and we are, of course, overwhelmed by digital information. But let's go back to the books, you know, let's try to look to the books and to the stories that we can find in the books and also the, the, the effect of the press printing that it had on people, the fact that there was access to stories and to information for so much more people than there was before. Before it was only for the intellectuals and of course for the religion. But uh, that, all of those things were for us very inspiring and we, we made a list uh, together with Patrice. Uh, some of you know Patrice, she's the artistic coordinator of Muse. We made a list of different ideas, starting from his, um, not life, but his way of thinking, let's say, his uh, mental life. We made a list, which we communicated with the artist. And actually, I have to say, after that, it's up to them. We trust them, once again, we give them, we give them the trust. And we tell them, look, this is for us what could be important, like his, his love for books, his, his uh, love for traveling. He was traveling all the time. He met a lot of different people. He was, of course, not traveling very far, but in Europe in that, in that time, it was very hard to travel, but he needed to travel. He wanted to meet different people. He found it very important. That's also something that we want to um, encourage to the kids, travel, I mean, in your mind or, or in real life, uh, please go and look for other horizons. I, I also read, when I was preparing this, I read an article in, um, in Knack, it's, um, it's a magazine in, in Flanders, which is more or less uh, an intellectual magazine, a very interesting article who says that, uh, like, for example, uh, the, the architecture, the way buildings were constructed uh, of the cathedrals, it, you could compare it to, to the pagodas, to the mosques, to the uh, churches in uh, Byzantium. So even the, the way the, the people at that time realized very complicated constructions in architecture were not only limited to Europe. Definitely not. Definitely not. It's very interesting to go and see what was happening in that time in other cultures. So we also want to uh, encourage this because, and then maybe I have to finish, uh, like you all know, we live in a totally different Europe now. We live in a world Europe. <laughs> uh, the whole world is represented in our schools. In the school in Ghent, where I'm going to work, let's say that two of the 16 kids are from uh, <laughs> Belgian background, how shall I say it? I don't know. You know what I mean? All the others have another background. So we want to uh, encourage this in intercultural idea and to open up Europe and not being too Eurocentric in our approach because we think we have to move, move on and, and look for the power of the dialogue and the exchange. So these are things that we really would like to explore in this project, and like uh, Annabelle said, we are not activists, we are creating processes, but we always hope a little bit, secretly, that they become stronger citizens, that they become more uh, conscious of certain things, of themselves and of the world they live in. And I want to end with a wonderful quote 
of a very important um, anthropologue. I think she was Margaret Mead. Maybe you know her? Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead. She said, teach children how they could think, not what they should think. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.